a very good evening viewers clearing preliminary examination is a mammoth task for many but why do you worry when you have the shankar ias academy with you yes the shankar ias academy has come up with the pre storming test batch 3 see already two batches are running successfully and here is the third batch which has already started with its orientation but you have a chance still because the first test is to begin on november 19 so the ambitious aspirants are still left with a chance are you all eagerly waiting to join so if you want to join click the link in the description and with this happy note let's get into the news article discussion for the date 14th of november 2022 displayed here are the list of news articles that we have chosen for today's discussion see we made it a point to discuss the editorial articles yes two important editorial articles are covered today and with that we have the other articles as well okay and without wasting much time let's get into the first news article discussion now take a look at this article here as per the article former chief justice of india said that the collegium system of appointment of judges is perfect this is about the news article given here and in this context we are going to learn about the collegium system in preliminary perspective see the collegium system is concerned with the appointment of the judges for the appointment of supreme court judges the constitution provides article 124 the clause 2 of article 124 says that every judge of the supreme court shall be appointed by the president by warrant under his hand and seal but this is after the consultation with the judges of the supreme court and high courts in the states as the president may deem necessary okay see note the word consultation very carefully based on this only collegium was established see supreme court in the three judges case has provided interpretation of this word consultation in the first judges case that is in the year 1982 the supreme court held that consultation does not mean concurrence it only means exchange of views then in the second judge case that is in the year 1993 supreme court held that consultation means concurrence so the advice of the chief justice of india is binding on the president in matters of appointment okay then came the third judge case in the year 1998 in this the supreme court said that consultation process to be adopted by the chief justice of india requires consultation of plurality judges see this means that the sole opinion of the chief justice of india does not constitute the consultation process and this is how collegium came into being see we have already seen the collegium in detail in our october 16 2022 analysis go and watch it it will be very much useful for you so what we are going to see in this discussion we will see who and all are consulted while appointing judges of supreme court and high court okay firstly let us see the appointment of the judges of supreme court for the appointment of the judges of supreme court the president should consult chief justice of india who in turn should consult collegium of four senior most judges of the supreme court and even if two judges give an adverse opinion he should not send the recommendation to the government okay and secondly the appointment of chief justice of high court and the high court judges See, while appointing the Chief Justice of High Court, President should consult Chief Justice of India and the Governor of the State concerned. Okay. And then for the appointment of other judges, the Chief Justice of the concerned High Court is also consulted. Okay. And apart from this, the third judge case said that in case of appointment of the High Court judges, the Chief Justice of India should consult a collegium of two senior most judges of the Supreme Court. Okay. So in a way to conclude this, during the appointment of the judges of Supreme Court and High Court, the President should consult Chief Justice of India. And in the case of appointment of Supreme Court judges, the Chief Justice of India should consult a collegium of four senior most judges of the Supreme Court. And in the case of the appointment of High Court judges, the Chief Justice of India should consult a collegium of two senior most judges of the Supreme Court okay so that's all we are done with this news article so in this news article we covered about the collegium system its origin and then we saw about the appointment of the judges of the supreme court and the judges of the high courts and the chief justice of high court okay so these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this editorial article it is talking about groundwater consumption 
See, look at the title of the article. It says, Saving the Precious. Here, the author denotes groundwater as precious. Firstly, what is groundwater? The water that exists underground in the saturated zones beneath the land surface is what termed as groundwater. And the upper surface of this saturated zone, no? it is what called as water table. And it varies from place to place. So, we can say that the water found below the water table is what called as groundwater. Now, what is the source of this groundwater? Its sources include the rainwater and water from other sources such as rivers and ponds. All these water infiltrates or seeps through the soil and fills the empty spaces and cracks that are present deep below the ground. This will recharge the groundwater. And another source of groundwater is aquifers. It denotes the places where the groundwater is stored naturally between layers of hard rock below the water table. See, this water can be pumped out with the help of tube wells or hand pumps. Okay. But my question is, is this groundwater everlasting? See, it could be everlasting if it gets replenished. That is, the water table does not get affected as long as we draw only as much water as what is replenished by natural processes. That is, we can say that it represents as much as water that can be recharged back by the natural processes. Okay. See, according to NCRT, no, total replenishable groundwater resources in India is only about 432 cubic kilometers. But this scenario changes when water is not sufficiently replenished. See, because it leads to depletion of groundwater. Now, the reasons for this is, that is the reason for affecting water table is, like common factors you can say, increase in population, industrial and agricultural activities, then scanty rainfall. Why is scanty rainfall caused? Like deforestation is one of the cause. Then you can take decrease in the effective area for seepage of water. See, seepage occurs only when there is soil. Am I right? You are filling the soil with waste materials. And how can the seepage of water take place? So, all these are the common factors or the major factors which are affecting the water table level. And now, with this basic understanding, let us see what is given in this editorial. See, according to a report by the Ministry of Water Resources, the total annual groundwater recharge, which is defined as the groundwater stored for the entire country is... 437.60 billion cubic meters. Okay. And out of this snow, the quantity which we are extracting is 239.16 billion cubic meters. Okay. See, this one compared to the 2020 assessment shows that the groundwater extraction is the lowest since 2004. See, this decrease in groundwater extraction may indicate better water management. However, the report says that the improvement is only marginal. See, this is evident from the fact that the percentage of blocks where the groundwater was critically low, no, was around 14 percentage. See, this is roughly similar to that of the previous year. Okay. Here you have to note the regions with the most critical groundwater blocks. See, this will be helpful for you to address any kind of mains answers. See, if you know the regions, you will definitely be able to know the causes because you know those regions are having low groundwater level. And you know what are all the activities occurring there. So, with that no, you can address the main type of questions. Here, take the Punjab, Haryana, Delhi and Uttar Pradesh. They are having the most critical groundwater blocks. See, in these regions no, indiscriminate groundwater withdrawal has led to the depression of the water table. This is despite the replenishable systems that are available. Okay. Then the other endangered blocks are in Rajasthan and Gujarat. Here, no, due to an arid climate, groundwater recharge itself is limited. Okay. And then finally, take the parts of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. They also have low groundwater availability. This is due to inherent characteristics of these areas. They have the crystalline water storing aquifers. Okay. This is what leading to low groundwater availability in these regions. Okay. So, now you saw what is groundwater, whether it is everlasting or not, how it is getting affected and which are the regions which are most affected. Now, coming to what has to be done. Firstly, there is no central law governing the use of groundwater. So, there is wasteful consumption of groundwater. 
and even when you take the state laws no they are deployed in a hasty or careless manner so new laws governing the consumption of ground water must be drawn see this is mainly to address the wasteful consumption and not to make money out of a natural resource okay be clear on that and secondly take the recommendations of the draft national water policy see it has recommended a shift in usage from water guzzling crops also it recommended to prioritize recycled water over fresh water for industrial purposes see all these no will help to lower the water consumption so following these recommendations will be really helpful in reducing the wasteful water consumption okay so that's all regarding this news article see this is such an important topic when you consider it for gs1 and our geography and our natural resources groundwater can be put as a question and when you talk about this groundwater it can even come in gs paper 3 because this groundwater depletion is an environmental hazard so that can also be there in the gs paper 3 so when you take this topic it is a very important topic for your mains okay and we made this editorial as an opportunity to recollect what is groundwater and what are all the causes for the depletion of groundwater and then we came into the news article discussion so these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article In this news article, writer Bayer Pa questioned the need for a statue for Tipu Sultan. This was during the release of the play Real Dreams of Tipu. See, this is the crux of the news article given here. And in this context, let us learn about the Anglo-Mysore Wars. See, Anglo-Mysore Wars are the longest military confrontations in the history of India. Know that they were fought for control over Mysore territories. and it was fought between the british and the rulers of mysore now coming to the wars the first anglo mysore war was fought between 1767 and 1769 see in this war no the nizam of hyderabad the marathas and the english allied together against hyder ali they waged war against each other for more than a year without any conclusion but when hyder ali sneaked into enemy territory it triggered chaos This forced the British to end the war with the Treaty of Madras on 4th April 1769. Okay, and now comes the Second Anglo-Mysore War. This was fought between 1780 and 1784. See, the main causes of this war were British not following the Treaty of Madras and Marathas attacking Mysore in the year 1771. Okay, and due to this, no, Hyder Ali sought the help of French for guns and ammunition. He started importing French war materials through Mahi in Malabar coast. British attempted to capture Mahi also, but that was not successful. Finally, Hyder Ali formed an alliance with Marathas and Nizam of Hyderabad. They plotted against the British and attacked the Carnatic. They also defeated the English army colonel Bailey in 1781. But the Marathas and the Nizam ditched Hyder Ali after diplomatic efforts by Sir Eyre Coote. Meanwhile Hyder Ali died in 1782 and his son Tipu Sultan carried the war for one more year since there was no positive outcome both sides opted for peace and concluded the war with the treaty of Mangalore in March 1784 so for the first anglo mysore war the treaty was the treaty of madras and for the second it is treaty of mangalore okay and then comes the third anglo mysore war it was fought between 1790 and 1792 The war began in 1790 when Tipu attacked Travancore. Since it was the only source of pepper for the East India Company, the British sided with the Travancore and attacked Mysore. Okay. Then in 1791, Lord Cornwallis marched to Serangipatnam. In this war also the Nizam and the Marathas supported the British. See Tipu offered serious opposition but he was eventually defeated in the year 1792. After the war the treaty of Serangipatnam was signed in the year 1792 then comes the final fourth anglo mysore war it was fought between 1798 and 1799 see in 1798 no lord wellesley came to india as the new governor general and tipu's relation with the french were seen as a threat by him so in order to overpower tipu lord wellesley forced him into submission through the subsidiary alliance but it was not enough for wellesley 
So the final war began on 17th April 1799 and ended on 4th May 1799. Note that the war ended with the fall and capture of Serengipatnam and the death of Tipu Sultan. See, it took 32 years to subjugate Mysore. As I said earlier, it was one of the longest military confrontations. And after the Anglo-Mysore Wars, the threat of French revival in the Deccan was also permanently eliminated. Know that the British chose a boy from Udaya dynasty as the Maharaja of Mysore. And the Udaya dynasty ruled the state of Mysore until 1947. And know that they also joined the Union of India. Okay. So that's all about this news article. See, through this news article, we covered about the most important wars in the Indian history. So through this discussion, we covered the most important topic for our UPSC prelims, which is the Anglo-Mysore War. See, not only for prelims, also for your mains regarding the wars, there might be questions. So this is a way of revising it. So here, for your preliminary perspective, know the year of the war and the treaty that was signed to end that war. Also know who are the parties who are fighting against each other. This will be more than enough to address the preliminary type of questions. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this editorial article. It talks about the issue of the climate financing. See, this article is written in the backdrop of ongoing negotiations as part of the Conference of Parties 27 to the UNFCC in Egypt. See, the article also discusses the issue of private climate financing and how developed countries are pushing for private financing over public financing. So, this is the essence of the article written here. In this context, through this discussion, we will learn about the important contemporary topic of climate financing in detail. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here for your reference. Kindly go through it. Now, let's start a discussion. See, before starting, you have to have an understanding of what is this UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement of 2015. See, yesterday only we covered both of these topics. So, kindly watch yesterday's Hindu News Analysis to get a complete understanding of this article. Okay? And to understand the issue which is discussed in the article, we have to start with a little bit of history. See, when we compare the cumulative carbon dioxide emissions of both the developed countries and the developing countries, we can see a stark difference. This difference is due to the difference in the start of industrialization between the two blocks. While industrialization started in the 19th century in the Western European countries and the United States, it took another 100 years to start in countries like India and China. Here note that industrialization didn't even start in many of the sub-Saharan countries. See, I am saying this till date, okay? But the issue of greenhouse gas emissions and its subsequent effect on the environment are affecting the whole mankind. Am I right? This is where the issue of climate financing takes central stage. So now, let's see the meaning of the term climate financing. Climate finance refers to local, national or transnational financing drawn from both public and private that seeks to support mitigation and adaptation actions that will address the climate change. Okay, so this is what we are terming as climate finance. Here note that the developing countries are asking for climate finance from the developed countries due to the historical emission gap between the two blocks. See, just now I explained the gap. Am I right? So, because of this only, developing countries are expecting from the developed countries. And due to this, in the COP21, that is the Conference of Parties 21, which was held in Paris, the developed countries agreed to provide $100 billion every year by the year 2020 to the developing countries. This is to help them undergo transition from fossil-based energy to green energy. So, this is all about the history of climate financing that you have to know. And now coming to the article. See, the article says that the Western countries led by US are trying to shift the burden to private finance from the public finance. Here note that public finance refers to the funding provided by the government. See, what the developing countries have for a long time insisted is that a significant portion of the climate finance should come from the public funds. Why are they doing so? 
because private finance will not be enough to address their needs and priorities. That is why developing countries are insisting for public finance. Here the author presents even the data from various sources to show that both the public and the private finance are falling short of the $100 billion pledge to be provided by the developed countries to the developing countries. So the author finally concludes that the blended financing model that is with the private financing is not apt for the needs of the developing countries. See the reason stated by the author is that the vulnerable, debt ridden and low income countries with poor credit ratings are in need of climate finance. So they find it challenging to access the private finance. See because they are already vulnerable and debt ridden. How far they can reach to the private finance? This is a question mark, right? So therefore, addressing the urgent climate finance needs of the developing countries cannot be left to the mercy of the false promises of trillions of US dollars in mobilized private climate finance. Okay? And the editorial says that a major role should be played by grant-based and concessional international public climate finance. So this is to address the needs and the priorities of the developing countries. So this is a brief about what is written in the article. Now before ending our discussion, let's see some important points relating to climate finance and India. See India is planning to raise private finance in climate change related industries in India. This is being done through Climate Finance Initiative. See, Climate Finance Initiative is functioning with an aim of building the early stage ecosystem in India for climate startups. And apart from this, India also wants a concrete plan for accessing the public finance from the developed countries. And this is from the $100 billion fund. So, this is about the India stand on climate finance. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion and through this discussion, we learned about what is meant by climate finance and the two types of climate finance, that is the public and the private, and also about the recent data sets relating to the $100 billion pledge by the developed countries. Finally, we saw about India-specific information about the climate finance. So, with these information, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. It says that Icelandic model of drug intervention will be a key topic of deliberations. And this is at the International Forum on Right to Drug-Free Childhood. So this is about the news article given here. In this context, let us understand about drug addiction in children in India and the steps taken by the government. See, in our country, the use of illegal drugs among youths is increasing, particularly in Punjab, 75% of the kids are using drugs. And data shows that 3 out of every 4 children in Punjab are badly addicted to drugs. In India, an NGO survey revealed that 63.6% of patients coming in for treatment were introduced to drugs at a young age that is below 15 years. See, in the year, Comprehensive National Survey on Extent and Patent of Substance Use in India was conducted. I have given the details of drug abuse in this table here. This table shows the data regarding the drugs used and the number of population in the different ages who are using it. See, please go through it. This is the case in India. And globally also the data is shocking. According to the 2021 World Drug Report, nearly 275 million people used drugs worldwide in 2020. And over 36 million people suffered from drug use disorders. Now we know how bad is the situation in Indian and the global levels. Let us see about the today's news article. See the meat which is called as children matter right to a drug free childhood is organized by the 4th Wave Foundation. 4th Wave Foundation is organizing this in partnership with United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and World Federation Against Drugs. See, this international forum on drug-free childhood will formulate a strategy and this is for necessitating policy and legislative interventions regarding drug use. And it will establish the need to create substance abuse-free environments for children around the world. 
So this is based on Article 33 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Children. See, the article obligates states parties to protect children and youth from involvement with illicit drugs and drug trade. And it is also said that Icelandic model will be the key topic in this forum. This particular model no, is important because it had shown significant changes in the Iceland. It is an environmental approach. In this model, parenting, parental supervision, organized leisure time activities, then together with increased normative pressures, that is curfew hours, and encouragement of joint family dinners, all these play a central role in reducing alcohol and drug consumption among young people. So now with this model, let us see the steps that are taken by the government to resolve the situation. See, the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment is implementing a scheme called National Action Plan for Drug Demand Reduction. Under this, financial assistance is provided for various programs and rehabilitation centers that are working for the reduction of drug addiction. And secondly, the Social Justice and Empowerment Ministry has launched Nasha Mukt Bharat Abhyan. This is to address the problem of drug abuse among youth of India. And this was launched in 272 most vulnerable districts since August 2020. Apart from this, no, we already have the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act 1985. See, under this act, it is illegal for a person to produce, manufacture, cultivate, possess, sell, purchase, transport, store and or even consume any narcotic drug or psychotropic substance. See, there are more than 70 substances that are banned under this act. And this includes cannabis, cocaine, heroin, then LSD, opium, MDMA, DMT, etc, etc. So that's all about this news article. See, in this news article discussion, we covered the much important topic for your mains perspective. See, this drug addiction, no, is very much important. And in this itself, I made a point to address what are all the steps we had taken to address this drug addiction in India. So these steps taken, no, can be put as a preliminary type of question. And regarding this Icelandic model also, I had explained to you very clearly. So, with the dynamic topic, we had understood the static part as well, okay? And with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, have a look at this article. See, this article is taken from the Education Plus column of the Hindu. It talks about the less concentrated side of children and teenagers by the educational institutions. What I am talking about? Yes, it is about the mental health. Here, note that this article becomes important in mains perspective. You can see here role of family, society and educational institutions in inculcating values. This is the statement that is straight away given in your GS4 syllabus. So you can use the points that we are going to discuss today in your mains answer directly. For example, if you get a question regarding the role of educational institution in addressing the student's mental health, you can easily take this point and put it over there. Okay. Now let's see what is said in this article. See the article starts with saying that COVID-19 has raised the mental health issues among the children and teenagers. Multiple reasons are put forward to explain this and some of them are social distancing, induced isolation, then anxiety and uncertainty about the future owing to the sudden outbreak of COVID. See the author suggests some ways to promote emotional and mental well-being in children by the educational institutions. So what are they? They are, firstly, schools should be made to use student-centered teaching strategies. See, this will promote a pleasant environment which further increases cooperative learning. And secondly, there should be a well-defined zero-tolerance policy on bullying. See, any type of harassment should be combated effectively within a defined time frame. Okay. And thirdly, a curriculum must be developed which specifically supports positive mental health. And finally, there should be a dedicated team that focuses on wellness initiatives. And it should work with vulnerable pupils who need special attention. So these are some of the suggestions put forward by the author in the article. 
and apart from these educational institutions must emphasize the development of an exclusive environment for all students see this is regardless of their socio economic or cultural background or gender see this will instill the students with a value system of accepting and accommodating people with a different culture and ideology when they become adults and finally the author ends the article by saying that joyful environment if maintained by schools will indirectly result in better academic performance of the students so with this we have come to the end of this discussion see if you ask me these are the points that are taken from the article and when you utilize these points in your main answers it is going to enrich your answer and make it look unique so that is why we had taken this opportunity to take some good points from good articles okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion see today we have three questions in which two i'll be discussing and one will be a quiz question for you okay now look at the first question it is regarding the collegium system in the indian judiciary here two statements are given so we are going to go through both the statements before arriving at the answer now look at the statement one it says the word collegium is not mentioned in the constitution of india what do you think about this you might think the statement is wrong but actually the statement is correct yes the word collegium is not mentioned in the indian constitution okay actually this collegium system is a way by which judges of the supreme court and high court are appointed and transferred the collegium system is not rooted in the constitution or a specific law promulgated by the parliament it has evolved through judgments of the supreme court okay and regarding this only we saw the three judges case in the discussion am i right if you haven't listened to the three judges case please go and do listen to it okay now coming to the second statement the high court collegium consists of the chief justice of india and four senior most judges of supreme court while if you take the supreme court collegium it will be consisting of chief justice of india and two senior most judges of the supreme court so just by looking at the statement if you had keenly observed the discussion i'm saying okay you can find that this both is just interchanged so what i'm coming to say here the statement is incorrect see i have just reversed the statement for high court collegium it will consist of the chief justice of india and two senior most judges of the supreme court and in case of the supreme court collegium it will consist of the chief justice of india and four senior most judges of the supreme court okay and since the question is demanding for incorrect statements your answer here will be option b two only okay now coming to the second question see india is a party to which of the following convention here i had given three convention am i right first one is the convention on narcotic drugs second one is the convention on psychotropic substances then the convention against illicit traffic in narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances see what is the answer here it is option d 1 2 and 3 that is india is a part of all these three conventions see regarding these conventions and all you need not know it completely just to know whether india is a part it to it or not that is more than enough to attempt any preliminary type of question so i am not going to discuss all these conventions in detail here today i took this question so that you have to know that india is a party to these kind of conventions okay because all these data is no is based on a drug addiction among youth discussion okay and now look at the quiz question for today see it is regarding our anglo mysore war discussion if you had keenly observed the discussion and listen to it it is very very easy question and you are going to comment me the answers in the comment section okay displayed here are two mains practice question see go through the question and try writing answer for this question it is going to be really helpful for your mains preparation okay and with this we are ending our today's discussion if you like this video do like share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the shankara is academy's youtube channel thank you for listening